Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse, and this is a long, anxiously awaited segment on credit default swaps. I have looked for three months for somebody, a place, an agency that would talk to us about what they are, how they work, why they were created, what are the upsides and the downsides to them in context. It was very difficult to find anybody in the United States, let alone in the world, to talk to us. But I feel very fortunate that some courageous women have come forward to share about credit default swaps. They have appeared to be financial weapons of mass destruction for some. For others, they have helped secure financing and have brought health to business and industry. But usually that side of the story is not told. We've invited from B&B Structured Finance, Terry Duyon and Betsy Medler to its rainmaking time, both from London and New York, to bring us the context of credit default swaps. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome B&B Structured Finance to its rainmaking time. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. We have heard that this is one of the most frightening instruments that's used as a form of contract. $60 trillion minimum of contracts made using this product. Talk to us about it. Give us the context. Lay out a frame of reference for us because most of us are not bankers and we're not in this echelon of finance. Well, I, I think it's probably important to start by explaining what they are. Um, and, and to put it in context that most people can understand, um, a credit default swap could very simply be described as credit insurance. So, for example, if I, I'm a bank, I give out a loan to IBM. If I decide that I really don't want credit risk, IBM, concerned that either I have to put up too much capital against IBM's credit risk or um, I have too much of IBM's credit risk already, then I can use a credit default swap. I can go out, I can buy protection, another entity, another bank or maybe an investor, for example. I can buy protection on IBM. I, I buy insurance. I pay a premium, a little premium, just like in the land of insurance, and I pay them a premium for the next five years. And if I lose money on my loan to IBM, it will make me whole. So, for example, IBM fails to pay me the principal back, or they pay me just a part of the principal, or they go bankrupt. Um, and I only get 20 of my 100 that I lent to IBM. Then the counterparty from whom I bought credit protection will give me the other 80. That's how a credit default swap works. Very simple at context. And the way to think about a credit default swap, to some extent, probably the ultimate origins of a credit default swap is in the form of a guarantee. So banks to provide guarantees to other banks um, the time in their own portfolios. And another, a simpler way to think about that is you think about the first time you've gone out to get a loan, you ask your parents to provide a guarantee to the bank that you will definitely be able to repay the loan because you don't have any credit history. So your parents will guarantee to the bank that whatever you don't pay back to the bank, your parents will pay. Now, your parents don't get paid for that, I guess, and <laughs> with the exception of maybe a <laughs> child, but that is a form of a guarantee or credit insurance against the loan to the individual. How did credit default swaps come about? Well, credit default swaps, I think, have I mentioned the banks have used products called guarantees for, for years and years and years and years and years. And what that means is a bank gives out a loan to IBM, 
and maybe the loan is quite big, the bank is uncomfortable with that size of loan on their balance sheet, it looks chunky compared to the other loans that they have. So they might go to another bank and ask for a guarantee on some portion of that loan to IBM. We'll pay that other bank some premium, some amount of money for that guarantee. Now, that sort of product, that guarantee, bank guarantees, they're not very standardized, they're not easy to trade, and they only exist in the loan world. So sometime in the 80s, so the story goes, one decided to create a standardized derivative could be traded that was effectively the essence of a bank guarantee. The story goes that bankers trust, but who really knows? Eventually, by the early 90s, many banks, many commercial banks in the U.S., meaning banks who gave out loans, not, not loans to retail, not loans to individuals on the street, but loans to corporates and other financials, so very large, what we would call commercial lending. Banks that gave out those types of loans had, were, were all starting to work together on creating a product called credit derivatives or credit default swaps. And what they were looking to do was manage the risk on their loan portfolios because loans are incredibly, they were very tailored, very difficult to trade, very difficult to manage the risk. So in the past, a bank would give out a loan and the loan would sit on that bank's balance sheet until it was repaid. So even if years after the bank gave out the loan, they were uncomfortable with the credit risk, they couldn't get rid of it. They couldn't manage the risk. And credit default swaps were created as a way for banks ultimately to manage the credit risk on their balance sheet. And what that really meant was that banks could, amongst themselves primarily, originally could exchange or move credit risk from one bank to the other. So, for example, Bank A has a great relationship with one company. With who? With one entity, let's say okay. IBM. So they end up, IBM comes to them for all of their lending needs. Well, eventually, IBM is an incredibly large institution. The borrowing needs of IBM may be too big for one bank. And again, if you have, you've lent to a hundred different corporates, um, let's say you've lent 10 million each, and one of those corporates is huge and needs a billion, then you have no diversification in your loan portfolio. As a result, you effectively have a loan that's outstanding of a billion, and that's the biggest risk you have on your balance sheet. That's an extreme example, but the point is that banks needed a way to manage and manage the credit risk on their books, make it a bit more dynamic in terms of being able to hedge risk if they didn't like it, meaning shift it, get it off of their books, um, and also try and create a diversified loan portfolio. That was the original driver. Does that, does that make sense? It does make sense. Part of the way you're articulating it, it sounds also as if a credit default swap functioned as a form of collateralizing instrument to make the loan be able to go through. Well, eventually it did become that way. And I, I wouldn't call it a collateralizing instrument. I would call it maybe a facilitating instrument. Okay, catalytic. That what would happen is that if, a loan came up for approval, a bank, the risk officers might say, you have appetite for this much only. Let's say the loan was for 100 and the risk manager says, we have appetite for 50. So the banker, the relationship manager, would say, okay, well, then let me go talk to the trading floor and see if they can shift the 50 in the form of a credit default swap. So I can still give 100, lend 100 to my client, but we'll go out and we'll shift 50 of it via a credit default swap. So it facilitated lending to the client. 
It facilitated the relationship for the bank because it allowed the bank to keep the relationship, to give out the loan, 